Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're digging into the latest NOAA advisory. There's this uh, official La Nina, but it's weak. We want to unpack what that means for this winter and maybe more importantly, the risk of a big flip in 2026. So it's official as of October 9th. But the key number, that Nina 3.4 index, it's barely there, right? Minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. It's like scraping into La Nina territory. Exactly. And that's the crucial thing for you, the listener, to grasp. Because it's such a marginal signal, the usual atmospheric effects we count on from the tropics, mm -hmm. they're likely to be, well, unreliable, intermittent yeah. at best. So to really get a handle on this winter, we have to look beyond just the Pacific surface conditions. We need to focus more on the faster atmospheric drivers, especially those at higher latitudes. Okay, that makes sense. If the main engine in the tropics is kind of sputtering, you look elsewhere. So this weak signal, what's it likely to mean for winter weather, say December through February across North America? Well, for North America, the expectation still leans towards a positive Pacific North American pattern. The PNA, you know, that pattern, the positive phase, usually gives you this big ridge of high pressure over the Western US. That generally means warmer and drier conditions out west. Okay, warmer and drier west. But what about the other side of that? Where does the cold air go? Uh, well, that's countered by a deep trough, low pressure, digging into the central and eastern states. Think of it like a pathway for cold air to spill south. So that increases the chances for what? Cold snaps? More snow? Yeah, exactly. Potential for significant cold and maybe above average snow, mm -hmm. especially thinking northern Rockies, the Great Lakes area. Maybe New England, too. Interesting, that atmospheric seesaw effect. Okay, let's jump across the pond. Europe, it's obviously a long way from the Pacific. How does a weak La Nina like this even connect over there? It's pretty indirect, really. The main connection seems to be through the stratosphere. The dynamical models are hinting just slightly towards a negative North Atlantic oscillation, the NAO. But maybe more critically, they're pointing towards a weaker, less stable polar vortex, you know, the PV that big circulation of cold air way up high. Okay, the polar vortex, I've heard of that. Right, so when the PV is weak or unstable, it makes it easier for chunks of that Arctic cold to break off and plunge south into the mid-latitudes. And because the La Nina itself is so weak, the state of that PV in the NAO, they really become the main drivers deciding if Europe gets hit with severe cold snaps. It kind of overrides the weak Pacific signal. Gotcha, so a very volatile winter picture, but this La Nina, weak as it is, won't last forever. What's the thinking for the big transition expected in 2026? The consensus, like from NOAA and IRI, points to a pretty quick decay. They see us heading back to Enzo zone neutral conditions probably by January to March 2026. About a 55% chance, so, you know, it's the most likely outcome. Okay, neutral is the baseline. But, and this is where it gets interesting, there's a notable outlier, the big European model, the ECMWF. It's actually forecasting El Nino conditions emerging by mid-2026, like... March, April, May. El Nino, that quickly, wow. Yeah, it's a pretty sharp turnaround, they're suggesting. And that represents this uh, high impact reversal risk that you really need to keep an eye on. And, okay, physically, how does that even happen? To go from La Nina, even a weak one, to El Nino so fast, you'd need something significant to overcome all that cold water currently in place, right? Precisely. You'd need a strong downwelling Kelvin wave. Mm -hmm. Basically, imagine a big pulse of warm water traveling eastward deep below the surface of the Pacific. It has to form relatively quickly and have enough punch to basically squash that existing cold water signature, that negative subsurface heat content. Mm -hmm. It's a big ask physically. Right. And the timing. And the timing. That forecast timing, March, April, May 2026, that falls smack bang in the middle of the spring predictability barrier the SPB. Ah, the dreaded SPB. Exactly. It's just notoriously difficult to make reliable ENSO forecasts during that period because the whole ocean atmosphere system is kind of in flux, making phase shifts really hard to call, adds another layer of, well, uncertainty. Okay, so I've got the near-term volatility, the medium-term reversal risk. Stepping back even further, what's the biggest long-term thing we should be watching in the Pacific? The structural background signal. Yeah, good question. If you zoom out, you have to look at the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO. Mm -hmm. This thing operates over you know decades. And right now, it's been in a cool phase for a long time, yeah. close to 30 years. 30 years? Wow. Yeah. Now, if we saw a sustained shift in the PDO back to a warm phase, that would structurally tilt the odds. It would bias the whole climate system towards stronger, perhaps more frequent El Ninos later this decade and beyond. Which would mean? More frequent spikes in global temperatures, essentially. That long-term PDO shift is arguably way more consequential for the bigger climate picture than just one winter's forecast. 
So if you ask me what to really monitor right now, it's two things. One, that subsurface ocean heat content, watching for any sign of that Kelvin wave needed for the El Nino flip. And two, the trend in the PDO index itself, these deep, slower moving structural shifts, they're the ones that really shape the climate long term.